All right, 97.7 Outlaw Radio FM listeners, we have the one, the only, the ever so talented Steve Penn right here, right now, live on the line. How are you doing this evening? Hey, man, I'm blessed. God bless, man. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good, man. Just trying to just trying to stay warm out here in Canada, man. You know, we're we're hitting uh we're in winter time right now, man. So it, she she's a tit bit nipply. Yeah, it's cold down here too, man. I'm in Georgia, man. Reporting live from the ATL. I just left Connecticut where it was colder, but it's cold down here too, man. So I'm reporting live from the ATL GA, man. And since you're in Atlanta, this is one thing I've always wanted to know, man. Like, do you guys get snow down there, or is it actually like the beach where you can just go to the beach and like the, on Christmas? Let me tell you something, man. We get snow down here, but it's not nothing like Canada or Connecticut. But when they do get snow down here, you would think that is World War Three <laughs> because there's nothing in the supermarkets, there's nothing on the shelves. People just don't know how to handle it, bro. But we do get snow down here, but not that often, man. Nothing like you guys do. But also, man, taking you back there a little bit, I have to ask you, like, what actually made you decide to get into the music industry initially? Well, I'm not really in the music industry. That's the thing. I just do music. I put an interview out a little while ago letting people know that music for me is just like having another arm or another leg. This is something that I just do, which is why I don't really, you know, I'm kind of like, um, I don't know. I don't know what you would call it, but, uh, like, I don't move with the music industry. You know, all my fans that, that appreciate my music, they move with me, just like fans should do when they have an artist that they adore. You know, so... Um, I don't put I don't I don't picture myself in the music industry, man. I just do music, man. That's just something that's just a part of me. So I let them adapt to me. And also, man, aside from your music side of things, I also noticed as well that in the year 1995, you actually auditioned for the lead role in Spike Lee's Clockers. I have to ask you, what was that experience like? Just being able to audition for such for such an amazing, amazing director. That was pretty. That was pretty dope, man. I actually went to an audition for the movie Clockers. I actually went for a friend, you know, because the friend was actually the person that was going for the role, and he asked me to go with him, ride the train with him, and be, you know, next to him while you know he goes in audition for Spike Lee. And um, I went there and I dressed up, you know, I got real fly, you know what I'm saying? I put on my Puma suede and all of that. And then, like, they basically skipped him and was like, yo, you, we want you to come back. And so what transition was me actually shooting for a role, for the lead role, which Makai Pfeiffer, uh, you know, everybody knows Makai Pfeiffer. Makai Pfeiffer eventually got the lead role, but that was the role that I was going for. And it was just by happenstance. Like, I, I just went in support of another person. And I ended up shooting for like six months. And I didn't get the lead role, but it was a cool experience, man. I got to chop it up with Spike Lee. I got to sit next to him. I got to talk to him. I, I was able to give him a demo. You know what I mean? And um, it was just a cool experience, man. Something that I could put in my resume. And also as well, man, like, because uh, you said you were filming for like six months. So there must they must actually have footage of you actually playing Mackay Pfeiffer's role. You never know. Maybe... With like an, they might have bring out an anniversary, uh, spe- like anniversary version. They might actually release that as a special, as a, uh, sorry, as a special features. Yeah, well, I I, I doubt that that uh, will ever happen because anything, the uh, only thing that translated from that was me taking a bunch of still shots of deaf people. You know, if you looking at, if you look at the beginning of the movie of Clockers, you see a whole bunch of people that were dead, shot in the head. You know, laying across couches, couches slumped over. You might, know, you might find me in there, but um, that's not what I shot for. He may have those that footage, but I don't have that footage, unfortunately. But nevertheless, like I said, it was a good experience, and um, big up to Spike Lee, man, and I hope to do something in the future. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I may hit Spike right now. He don't know, may me, and I have no idea who I am, but um. But it was a good experience, and so I look forward to doing more, like, movie stuff in the future, you know, so, yeah, it was pretty dope, man. And 
And also, you are the CEO as well of uh, Steve Penn Music. I have to ask you, what's the story behind that company? And of course, like, uh, what services do you guys offer to the general public? Well, basically, man, you know, we don't really stream a lot of music. I think that streaming is good for a lot of different um, artists, but for artists, all the independent artists out there, I really think that you need to use streaming to your advantage. I don't think that is wise to put your main catalog on streaming platforms. I think you it's okay to, um, you know, to um, play with the idea of streaming different um, music that you may have, but maybe for your for your your your, your main your main um, archives catalogs, I think that is essential that artists have, you know, their own platforms such as their own websites. Steepinmusic.com is exactly that. You know, like all the albums or full catalogs that I may drop, you can only get them on Steepin Music. You know what I'm saying? I have a few songs out there for Spotify and iTunes. I don't really like the whole idea that these streaming platforms are paying less than a penny, you know, per stream, like 0 0.00034, whatever the numbers is. It's not even a penny. I don't even know what that math is. I don't think we learned that type of math in school. When you got these artists out here, you know, they're really fighting over, you know, streams. You got all the saying stream for stream, play for play, follow for follow. And it's just like a big guy over here, you know, with a big piece of chicken bone. And you got all these artists fighting over this chicken bone. And so that's why, you know, I'm doing Steve Penn music. Anybody that's feeling me, my true fans that love me, I feel like, Real fans are going to follow you. They're not just going to stream your music. They're going to actually pay for it. People are not paying for music because they don't have to no more. If your artists are paying, putting uh, all your music out there for free, then who's going to pay for it? So it's really the artist's fault that, art, uh, that consumers are not paying for music. And so that's the whole purpose of SpeakPinMusic.com. And I have to agree with you, man. It, 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 it's very shysty that these uh, that these uh, music platforms are actually doing that. In my personal opinion, what, what I think they should do, just like when you go out and buy a CD, you know, say like your CD's 10 songs. If someone listens to your CD from track 1 to say track 10, that should be 10 bucks. You know what I mean? Like narrow it down to 10 bucks. I, that's what I mean. That's what they should be doing, but they're not, unfortunately. They want to rip off the middleman. Yeah, and I don't think that's good, man. And I think that, you know, artists need to wake up. You know, you know, back in the day, you'll hear a bunch of artists talking about how the music industry has jerked them or whatever. But I really feel like it's the same thing that's going on today. You know, artists are so thirsty about getting on, and the main big head honchos know this. And so they, they can manipulate the game to make you fight for, you know, recognition. Really, honestly, man, it's okay to use the streaming platforms because I think it's a great idea. But you gotta you gotta use it to your advantage. It's just another tool. That doesn't mean you put your albums up there. That don't mean that you put your main shit up there. That just means you put the songs out there if you're collaborating with other independent artists and you don't really want to get in bed with them with business wise, then you know, put it up there to stream and let them get their ISRC codes and barcodes and let them calculate they and keep in track with their own musical streams and things like that. But for your own independent releases, I think you every artist should have a hub. I think that every artist should not fall into the trap of, you know, get stuck in the idea of how many views you have. I think that email addresses and things like that are more important than how many views you have because personally I will have I will, I will rather have five hundred email addresses of true fans than fifty thousand viewers that I don't have email addresses on. And I think this is the way that the industry is moving. And I will be having some like some lectures and some seminars, you know, based on that. And um, it's trying. To, it's time to take the uh, the power and the control of the independent artist music back. And I most definitely agree with you, man. Like me personally, I don't even use Spotify or anything of that nature. Um, I don't even have that stuff on my phone, man. I would. I will actually 
buy people's music. If I really support an individual, I'll buy the single, but I won't stream it, man. That's why I was really upset when Google Play Music switched over to YouTube Music, because that was my main source to purchase songs. Now I got to go through Amazon, which I I can't stand Amazon, man, because I always like charge my card for like fees that I didn't that I didn't purchase. I hate it, but. Yeah, you well, well, you, well, you know what? It's not totally their fault, man. It's some of the, it's a lot of the artists' fault because they don't know no better. Like these art, these artists are miseducated, like people back in the day that was getting jerked for deals. It's the same thing that's going on. These same people that was jerking people for deals a long time ago are the same people that's sitting behind the walls of Spotify and iTunes and all these other. Um, platforms and big up because they're doing good things. What they're doing is not bad, but it's totally up to the artists to decipher which way they want to use these platforms. You know, if you think that loading up your uh, loading up your full LP or your album to Spotify, you're gonna get just do. You're sadly mistaken. You're better off having your artist, your consumers, follow you. Like, if they really support you, they're going to support you. If they're not going to support you, then fine. Those are not the people that's supposed to be supporting you anyway. And that's how I move, and that's how my crew move. You know, we, we got all these people out here trying to do this and that. And the third, with uh, streaming, we're totally against it. We're not totally against it, but we're going to use it to our advantage and use it out. It's just a tool. Use it for what it's for. You have to have the common sense of say, like, oh, make sense of it all and say, yo, listen, I'll release a few uh, uh, pieces that are um, available, that can be available for some of the people that only listen to Spotify and listen to iTunes. But for our main catalog, you need to come see stevepenmusic.com. And I think any artists out there that's doing the independent should think this way. And also, you were con- uh, sorry, you were actually contacted to create some music for the Atlanta Hawks cheerleaders. Uh-huh. I have to ask you, man, how did that opportunity come to be for you? And of course, what was it like actually just being able to work alongside the Atlanta Hawks? Well, that was pretty dope, man, because I'm surprised you even know about that. But, um... Um, it was a cheerleader. It was a lady that was running for Miss Pageant of Atlanta. She wanted me to uh, create a routine so she can do her uh, her routine to uh, so that she can solidify her spot and uh, Miss America or wherever it was, whatever it was. I don't even know, but it was cool, man. It, you know, it pushed it pushed my limits. I know I, I know I know that I'm an artist that could do any type of music. That's why I tell people in the industry, I'm a different artist. I'm a different type of artist. Like, I don't buy ads. I don't do none of this. You're going to either, either respect it or not. And so with that particular project, you know, it really pushed my creativity. And um, somebody notified me and was like, listen, this girl named Christian, she needs this and that and a third for because she's going for Miss Pageant. She's an Atlanta Hawk dancer. I can't even tell you who it was that called me. It was somebody from somebody that I don't even know it was a regular person that called me. And um, I did it, and she won first place, actually. You know what I mean? She won first place, actually, which kind of kind of right now is making me think, like, man, maybe I should go uh, maybe pursue more radio type of situations like... um. You know, I, I do a lot of drops and stuff for people. Like, I do magnificent drops for people. I don't do regular drops. You know, you got a lot of artists right now charging radio stations and radio people, personalities for drops. I think that's absurd. But if, I, if somebody call on me to do a drop, I'm going to give them a drop because I'm going to ask them for certain things. I'm going to ask them for certain tags, and I'm going to incorporate that in my drop. But basically, back to the Atlanta Hawk situation, it was just it was a situation that came to me. It was a good opportunity, and I put my heart into it. She ended up winning first place. Atlanta Hawks know nothing about this, or probably, you know, anybody from Atlanta Hawk Arena knows about it. But um, I did it. Me and her know about it, and the people 
the people that was included in that uh, event know about it. So it was a good thing, man. And I have to ask, did you have the opportunity to meet any of uh, the Atlanta Hawks players, or was it just the cheerleaders? Nah, man. You know, one of the things that I recognize is that, you know, people, you know, when they do, it's hard enough to get established, and it's hard enough to, like, get people to recognize your talent. But a lot of people in the field and a lot of people in this industry that mean you are in, if you don't have a personal relationship with them, then it's kind of hard for them to, you know, keep mentioning you. Like you gotta, you gotta kind of stay on them. You know, they kind of get what they want from you, and then they move on. <laughs> That's basically what happened. And she's not the only person that I've done stuff for. There's some heavy hitters that I've done some things for, and I won't mention no name because of political re- reasons. But you know. These people, you know, when they talk about the music industry being, like, real savage-like, it's real. You know, people will get with you. I call it crack on wax. It's like the crack game, but on wax, like records, like, you know, the music industry. I call it crack on wax. People will use you. People will get, get you to jump on board for their agenda, and they'll forget you. Because that same person I was doing all this stuff for, they wouldn't even answer their phone after the mission was completed. And that's why I have a whole different, like, percept- like my perception never changed about the music industry, but I know what I'm dealing with. So I'm like, you know what? Nobody can stop me from doing music. Nobody can blackball me because we have this wonderful thing called the World Wide Web. I just do what I do, and I meet with people that feel the same way or understand, you know, they may not have the same experiences that I had, but they will recognize real. So I just keep it pushing, man, and I'm going to continue to keep it pushing. I'm not an artist that came on here 10 years ago. I'm 43 years old, and I have no problem telling my age. I'm 43 years old. I've been doing this shit since I was 12. And so um, I connect with people like you. Big up for having me on your radio show, Outlaw Radio. You know what I'm saying? I thank you. You know what I mean? So, um, and, I, and I love what you're doing, man. I love what you're doing, and you keep doing it, and never get discouraged, man. Never, just keep doing it. If you have a vision, just keep pressing forward. I appreciate you, man. I really do. But also, man, speaking of uh, radio, man, you also have your own radio show called uh, Two True Radio. I was wondering if you tell us cool. the story behind that, man. And, of course, where can we check that out? Well, I don't have 2 True Radio right now. Actually, 2 True Radio took place back in early, like, 2000, maybe 2009, 2008. But 2 True Radio was basically, you know, where we um, give, give gave light to un- independent artists. 2 True was a guy that moved all the way from California down here to Atlanta, Georgia, because I only submitted some music to him, and he liked me so much that he wanted to do a whole show with me. This was back on Blog Talk Radio, and we had a problem with it because Blog Talk Radio didn't have good quality. We was always talking about how we could make our quality better. Now we look back 15, 10 years later, everybody has a digital radio station now where you can plug it into your car and it sounds good. But back then, it was raw, just like hip-hop. We didn't have, it was an introduction to online radio. So I had 2 True Radio where I did, um, I designed, I crafted, uh, you know, intros and um, commercials and did drops and I introduced them. We introduced uh, independent artists from all over. And um, you couldn't listen to it how we listening to you now. You had to listen to it through your phone. That was the only way that you could listen to it. And um, somebody told me, yo, you'll get another shot one day again to do it again. But I just never felt, you know, I never felt the need to, like, pursue it because I wasn't a true radio personalist. But um, it was dope. It was good. I was able to get a, give a lot of people some shine. And um, it's all, it was all for the independent artists, so it was a dope experience. And I would be 
be honest, man, running a podcast and radio show is fun, man. But the one thing that I actually enjoy more than doing that, man, is actually turning that podcast into a, ra- a full, full-fledged full radio station, man. Do you ever think that maybe you might kind of do the similar thing as well and actually turn uh, True 2 Radio actually like into like a, into an actual radio station itself? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm definitely in the, um, in the mix and some conversations with his sons. Two True died about maybe about 10 years ago, if that. And every once in a while, his sons... Um, they contact me and, and and we and we and we fancy and we entertain the idea of bringing Two True Radio back. I can tell you that Two True Radio, the guy himself, Two True Radio had the the, the perfect radio voice, especially for under uh, underground hip hop radio. Two True Radio, that guy Two True had the perfect voice. He just there's just some people that have have that voice, and he had it. And um, I, I do still have some clips of him just saying, True True Radio. Like, I, I, I record everything, you know what I'm saying? And if I was in place, I would, I would be recording the show right now. You know what I'm saying? But, um, but yeah, I do. You know, I, I would really love to do it right now. I do, like, backup music and commercial music and drops for the Chub Rock show with his wife, Kiki Rock. She has a show called A Clean Up Woman where she plays all ODs on Saturdays, music that you'll clean your house to. And then we go into two, tr- um, not too true, excuse me, but tongue therapy where we, you know, dedicate that show to, uh, you know, independent artists. And I do all the like drops and theme music for that. So I'm still heavily involved in radio. I, I do the dopest drops. I, ain't, I, I mean, I got a niche that, um, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but um, most artists don't take their time. There's a void there. I don't think that most artists take their time to nurture that void to give people like yourself dope-ass drops. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, definitely, man. Maybe one day, you know, I, you know, you might see, you might see Steve Penn Radio or something like that. And also, man, on November 10th of this year, so sorry, jumping ahead in the timeline, you actually released the album, uh, 40 Volume 1. I have to ask you, what's the story behind that amazing record? And of course, where can our listeners buy themselves a copy of your brand new, uh, of your brand new record? Yeah, well, you know, 40 Volume 1 is an album, you know, that me and my brother, my little brother, he produced the whole album. Um, Bill Blast Pro, you know what I'm saying? Basically, 40 Volume 1 has two, like, meanings to it. You know, I'm a, I'm an artist that's well into his 40s. You know, you got this thing out here, hip-hop, you know, the hip-hop culture is the only culture that say, yo, you have to be a certain age to, um, to, pr- to pursue, uh, hip-hop music. So I named it 40 Volume 1. Meaning that every time I turn another age or another year goes by, while I'm in my 40s, I'm going to drop another volume. And so what it really is is that, yo, it's just telling people that's in my age group that whatever it is that you do, whether it's music or whatever you want to pursue, that you're not too old to do it. Kind of sort of like how Mike Tyson brought back the trilogy. You know, him fighting Roy Jones. Because there was people that felt like, yo, you're too old to do something. And in hip-hop, we're the only genre of music that puts age limits and put age stamps onto what you can do. And so I named it 40 Volume 1. Let people know I'm 40, and this is the first year. I started that album when I was 41 years old. And basically, it tells you, you know, never give up on your dream, basically. No matter how old you are, no matter how the game has changed, you can still put an album out independently, and you don't have to stream everything to get your money. People are only streaming because you allow them to stream it, because that's what Simon says to do. Be different and take the music back. DJs are even suffering from it. DJs can be easily replaced nowadays because somebody has the capability to go up there and put, plug in a Spotify playlist, and I don't have to pay this DJ one hundred and fifty thousand, one hundred and fifty dollars to rock the party tonight. They're losing, and 
sometimes I feel like the DJs don't even recognize how much they're losing. Because everybody so far, everybody far, like hip hop is one of the, 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 the hardest things to break into. But at the same time, they're the easiest followers to persuade what somebody leads. And so that's what 40 Volume 1 is about. Basically, in a nutshell, it's a 40, uh, 40-year-old artist plus that's still nasty with it and showing, how, showing people how to get it, basically, independently. And also, I have to ask, man, do you have any hard copies available for the old-school listeners that really still do love that compact disc format? Well, well, what we plan on doing right now is, um, you know, everybody who bought the first couple hours, uh, albums, um, we are planning to push it up on vinyl, not CD, but vinyl. We want to be able to give you an album sleeve and an album cover with some wax in it. And so, being that we're independent artists and we're real people and we have real, like, situations, um, uh, I, I try to include everybody on the email list, which you are on my email list. And so when we come up with the, um, like, the hard sleeve, like, we want to do vinyl so people can have it as collector's items. And we want to give everybody who actually bought the album, because amazingly, you know, and I'm glad that I have the opportunity to say this, but amazingly, like, all the people that was pushing me to do the album and was waiting for for me to do the album, there's only like two people out of 300 people that was, you know, that I would have thought that would have bought the album as soon as I dropped it. All I heard was crickets. Most of my sales came from people that I didn't even know. I didn't even know these people when they bought them. And I did more, I, I did more, I did more volume than somebody that has 100,000 streams. I did more, I, I mean, more independently. My reach may not have been as far, but money-wise, I did more than somebody that would have bought $100 streams, pushing it with no advertisement, just by word of mouth and dealing with beautiful people like yourself. I've got, I made more money than someone that has made $100 streams. So if that's not something to tell all the independent artists, like, it's cool to, the fool with the whole streaming thing, but never put your whole, but never put all your eggs in one basket. Use it accordingly. And I have to ask you, Steve, what is next for you? Is there anything I happen to miss during this interview? Anything else you still would like to promote? We still have you here live on ninety-seven point seven Outlaw Radio FM. Well, definitely, man. One of the things that I would love to promote because you can get all the access right here on www stevepinmusic.com I will be doing some motivational speaking because there's some people we got a lot of dead rappers going around I think this is something that needs to be addressed nobody's addressing it we got a song called Put the Guns Down it's dedicated to that you know what I'm saying and um you know so I'll, I'll be doing some speaking engagements anybody that you know is interested on learning more about it they can definitely w uh, visit www.stevepinmusic.com. Then I, I'm following up with another album called Something New Under the Sun. You know, my whole concept under that is that everybody would tell you, well, I don't care who did what, who did this, who did this. There is nothing new under the sun. I beg to differ. I think everything that's created that is new, even Outlaw Radio, is something new under the sun because it's never been done before. And I think that people that say that there's nothing new under the sun, they kind of come across to me as haters. You know what I'm saying? So my next album has not got nothing to do with the 40 Volume 1 series that I plan on making. It's an off album to the left album. It's called Something New Under the Sun, and that will be dropping pretty soon. I look forward to see, having that out there by like, maybe like, like late, late spring, early summer. So you guys be looking for that. But 40 Volume 1 is still out there. It's an 11-track banger. You know, I let some of them out. I let some of the singles out. But, uh, man, I got a lot of stuff, man. Like, uh, I don't know. Just follow me on FB and all of that stuff. You'll see what I'm, you know you see how I feel about other artists and, um, you know, get to really 
definitely know me, man. You know what I mean? So uh, I appreciate you for having me, man. And also, quickly, Steve, this is the time in the interview that I give a chance for the individual that slides into the radio station airwaves. Just a chance to give shoutouts to whomever they want to give shoutouts to. And of course, man, if you can, drop them social media handles. That way our listeners can follow you and stay updated on everything Steve Penn music if they're not already doing so. Well, most definitely, man. I want you to. Give, I, want, I want to give a big shout out to my little brother, man. My brother Bill Blast Pro. I want to give a um, shout out to my to my boy DJ Ray Battle, the Boom Boom Room. My boy DJ Sean Swift is all DJs that support me. Like DJs are mad important. Like people are really forgetting the essence and what role that DJs truly play in a role of hip hop and getting noticed. Everybody that uh, bought the 40 volume one, big up. I, I'll definitely be hitting you with that vinyl pretty soon for the real DJs that like the needle on wax. You know what I'm saying? I will definitely be hitting you up, man. Uh, my man, uh, Chuck Rock, you know what I'm saying? Kiki Rock for putting me on blast and um, letting me contribute to their radio platform. And just everybody, man, that loves hip-hop, like true hip-hop listeners, hey, yo, man, big up, and thank you for all the support, man, and keep doing your thing, man. And I first and foremost have to say quickly, Steve, thank you so much for just taking the time out of your busy evening and coming on 97.7 at Live Radio FM. It was an absolute honor and most definitely a privilege, man, and I hope down the line we can make this happen again. Hey, yo, we definitely will, man, and don't never be afraid to reach out to me. Like, if you ever want drops, on a strength, I'll do it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you want me to crash something? I got you, brother. Hey, man, I greatly appreciate that. I, I'm going to be honest. I might actually just hit you up on that offer. But for now, Steve, I got to sure. say, man, thank you so much again for taking the time out. And I got to say, most definitely, enjoy your stay out in Atlanta, but most definitely be safe out there, man. Yeah, man, and I live in Atlanta. My stay was in Connecticut, but I live in Atlanta. But thank you for all the blessings you sent my way. Hey, man, you are most certainly welcome. Have yourself a wonderful night, and we most definitely shall talk soon. Peace. All right.